Okay, I'll, I'll just say a little quick thing here about this as we're gonna walk past this sign since there's no snowy plover exclusion fences out at the moment. Historically, there's been a lot. So snowy plover, beach dwelling bird, uh, uh, rare, used to be ubiquitous all across the Southern California Bay, actually much wider than that, but but um, Ormond Beach is one of our hot spots. Ormond Beach, um, uh, a Naval Air Station, uh, or Ventura County um, uh, Naval Air Weapons Station is one of the, what am I saying? Naval Base Ventura County, the name keeps changing. Naval Base Ventura County uh, is one of the epicenters of them. But so these guys are a little small. These guys are about the size of your fist. A little like sort of sanderling, kind of um, uh, sandpiper sized bird, shorebird. Um, they nest on the beach. Their eggs are the color of sand. Their response is, don't move when a predator comes. And wait, 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 it's a freeze. So in some situations that can be great if it's a crow looking for you and, it, and you're not trying to move. If you are a lifeguard, LA County lifeguard, uh, you know, Baywatch truck freezing in place, not a good, not a good move, right? Um, so so our, our typical management response has been to fence off where, where they have eggs. At Ormond, this is, the, this is the clearest place. We have very substantial fencing that is permanent. So that a significant chunk of Ormond is fenced off so that we do not step on their eggs. Um, we have several projects looking at, at nest success and things of that nature, um, which is cool. Um, uh, here, the fences, you won't, you won't see any fences now. Historically, how it, okay, this is, we're about to enter Surfrider Beach, famous Surfrider Beach, a surfing heritage, uh, uh, you know, important thing. Historically, important place, all this kind of stuff for people like to surf. So this will be packed with surfers on, on a good wave. This will be like, you know, 200 people in the water, 300 people in the water. Um, um, and so, and huge economic boom. Like this is, what are we, it's Friday morning, right? How many people have we passed? We've already passed probably like 50 people just on our walk out here, right? Weekend, thousands and thousands and thousands of people can be walking by here if we, we hang out here for a morning, right? So very important economically, very important recreationally, etc. cetera. And you just see when we walk out here, it's not a massive beach, relatively small beach. To put up fences means people can't use the beach, right? So it's a little exclusion fences to protect the birds. So in, pla in places like Venice and, and Venice Beach, other, other places, the idea historically has been when we see the birds are here, we either fence off the whole beach or a significant chunk of the beach, one, or two, we put up temporary fences. So we walk out like, oh, here's a nest. Let's go, let's go put some stakes around and, right? And the nest will be there for many weeks or so, right? So let's fence that off. Here, the compromise that was made last time we had fences was, we'll put the fence over there. Uh, months ahead of time. The birds might nest in there. They might nest outside of the fence. But the compromise, the management compromise here was, uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can. Because if we just shut down the whole beach, then less people are gonna come. People aren't gonna recreate here. The, business, the businesses aren't gonna get as much business. So in this case, it was a, it was a compromise decision where to put the fences. But again, right now we won't see any fences. So that's uh, snowy plovers here at Malibu. Okay, this will be our last stop. I will slowly meander back after this, answer anybody's questions. I encourage you guys, if you have the time, to hang out, take some pictures, walk around, look at stuff, hang out for the day, whatever, if you can, or whatever. But uh, we'll end here, so if you guys do have um, classes to get back to, whatever, you guys, you guys can just head back to your car and, and migrate home. Um, okay, so uh, this is the mouth, right? So this is the sandy, again, the sand is coming down from there. Moving this away down coast. There's Malibu Pier over there. There's a wooden pier. So normally, where I'm standing, 
uh, you know, I would be, I don't know, waist high or, or so in, in a sand, uh, and, and into the sand dune. <clears throat> so obviously we're open now, so we have a, a full connection with the ocean. As we look right here, it looks like tide, the tide's rising. So the ocean water is filling in and bringing seawater into the lagoon. At other times, when, when the tide is low or it's rain and this mouth is open, we'd mostly be pushing fresh water out to the ocean. We're standing on a big, broad, flat uh, sand plain, a sand flat. The back over there had muddy, fine silts, right? Kind of smelled stinky and all that kind of stuff. Here we have sort of a similar topology, but notice there's no algae buildup here. It doesn't smell stinky, right? So this is, there's, there are not as many fine sediments deposited here, right? So because this is where the water is whooshing in, whooshing out, those fine grain things are, 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 are kind of have been flushed out over here, right? As the water is moving fast, it can hold big pieces of things, medium pieces of things, small pieces of things. When the water slows down, that's when things start to fall out and drop and are deposited. So that's why the back channel has so much more of that accumulation of, of fine sediments, etc. What else do you want to say here? Uh, so yeah, a big, a very popular place. If we just look, we can see there's all kinds of mixed gull colonies here. The, generally speaking, the dark ones are juveniles. Um, there's western gulls here, Californian gulls here, Bonaparte gulls, various things. Gulls are notorious for making mixed species flocks. Not all birds will do that. As we look, uh, as we look more towards the, the middle, we start to see things like, there's a, I see a pelican, big pelican there. There's some egrets. Um, I can't tell what those shorebirds are over there, but something, some shorebirds all sort of nesting, sort of hunkering down. Um, and so again, this is a great place. Birders love this place. It's, it's a nice, in a very small area, you get a nice range of the different types of birds, etc. So in any event, notice that this area is the least vegetated of all the areas we were at, right? So this area is basically sand, maybe some bird poop, maybe some, some algae, maybe some macrocystis rack, but no, no uh, 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 permanent vegetation. Um, so that means, that tells us that this sand is much more dynamic here. And even just, just right behind it, you can see in the planted area that we were mentioning before, we have all that, all the sort of uh, 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 non-changing vegetation where it's more mature, all that good stuff. Now, in a, in a completely well-functioning Southern California salt marsh, we would expect to see, like we have the vegetation there, we'd expect to see at least some of that, at least some of those sort of vegetated, or at least proto-vegetated dunes in this area. But obviously there's tons of people that come here. People are stepping on stuff. So if any little baby plant started to walk, it would probably get, you know, crushed by someone, that kind of deal. So, um, so there we go. So we've gone from the parking lot down to the ocean edge. Um, it would be great if I could walk you more into the salt marsh, but obviously that would encourage other people to come off trail and all this and that. So we haven't done that. We've looked at um, a couple key uh, plants. So we talked about Jaumea. We talked about uh, salicornia or pickleweed. We talked about the stickless or salt grass. And we talked about uh, the one shrub we mentioned was atroplex, the atroplex shrub. We talked about a couple of key species, things like snowy plovers, or, or, or say, a species of management concern, snowy plovers, tidewater goby. We haven't talked much about invasive species, but that's fine. We, we can talk about that in another site, but, but, uh, um, so yeah, so that, that, that's, that's the quick and dirty. Uh, questions, you guys have general questions about something I didn't touch on or something you guys were wondering about, generally speaking? Yeah. Is that the tapia water line over there? Is that what oh, you're talking about? The question is, is that tapia? That, that, that is something, I don't know if that, I think that might be municipal water, I think. I think it might be regular water, not, not sewage. I'm not sure, I'm not positive. Okay. But it's, it's, def it's definitely, there's liquid moving in there. I'm not, I'm not sure which one it is, but yeah. I didn't see the pipelines when you pointed them out. I was wondering. Oh, yeah, no, you wouldn't. They'd be buried. Under, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Other general questions? Anybody have anything they're wondering about? Okay, then, then yeah, go ahead. How far can the salt water make it up? 
Oh, okay, great question. The question is, how far does the saltwater lens penetrate into the salt marsh? It's gonna completely be determined on the local geomorphology and the tide level. So the term we use for that is um, the, the tidal prism, or well, that, not exactly the term, but, but the, the, a key term related to that is the tidal prism. So that means how far inland does the salt water go into the salt marsh or into the estuary? And or how far does the freshwater tongue extend out into the ocean? And so it'll, it'll vary both by tide, so it'll be va vary by the hour. Uh, well, I guess, assuming the mouth is open. If the mouth is closed, it won't vary as much. But assuming the mouth is open, it'll vary by hour, it'll vary by season, and it'll vary by weather conditions. So if we get a big storm downpour, you know, a big dump of water, it'll, it'll, push, the, it'll uh, push the salt much farther out. And so the answer is it'll vary. Here, for example, we have a tide coming in. This is gonna be salt slash brackish water. Probably, you know, well, uh, it'll, it'll be something other than fresh water past the bridge. Oh. And possibly significantly farther, depending on the, the situation. So this whole area is potentially a mix of fresh to salt. Oh, yeah, what are the birds? Sorry, what are the birds want? Oh, uh, so the question is, what are the birds eating right now? Uh, I think those guys are just get drinking, I think. Oh, no, sorry, no, no, no. So, okay, it looks like they're pulling up pieces of uh, macrocystis, so, so algae. So they're probably looking for, they, I mean, I guess in theory they can eat the algae, but really they're looking for stuff that's encrusting on the algae. Um, but, I mean, I mean uh, uh, gulls are like, you know, the largest population of gulls, I think, in the world is in this garbage dump in Kansas. So gulls are really opportunistic, and so they're gonna get whatever they can get. They'll eat some dead things, they'll eat some garbage, they'll eat some this. So they're really more just like, what's that? What the hell's that? So, so my stand here, I have this bag on my stand, which is coming off. Uh, because I'm, I've so well designed my, my field gear. And when I came out here last week and was, and was doing some initial videos, I uh, put it down and a gull walked up and was trying to eat my plastic bag. I'm like, dude, there's concrete in there. What? He's like, what's that, what's that, what's that? So they really, they really just are anything unusual they'll go check out.